Hi, this is Matt McCormick. I'm in the Department of Philosophy at California State University in Sacramento. Uh, my email address is mccormick at csus.edu. This is the lecture on integrated information theory from uh, Tannoni and Christoph Cook for my Philosophy of Mind course. Uh, okay, so let's get started. Uh, so Tononi and Cook are taking a really different approach to the question of consciousness and I've included this discussion in this course because it's gotten quite a bit of attention and starting to catch on um, and get referred to and get discussed in academic circles especially in neuroscience cognitive science circles and perhaps the most notable aspect of this theory is that they are trying to make a paradigmatically scientific empirical account of consciousness that produces predictions uh, that gives us uh, allows us to quantify or measure consciousness and gives us some sort of operational way to define empir empirically observe uh, quantify and put a metric on you know this notoriously difficult and nebulous topic consciousness so uh, their goal then is to render consciousness into a measurable empirically, empirically verifiable phenomena that can be studied scientifically. Now the net result of this approach, and you're going to have a bit of vertigo when you try to read and understand what they're talking about, is that you'll hear them using some of the same terms we've been using, especially with very profoundly philosophical accounts that aren't so scientifically empirically measurable. Um, they're using some of the same terms, but they seem to mean something really, really different. Uh, they're redefining some of these notions. So just remember that when they're using consciousness, when they're using especially qualia or quail quality, uh, qualities, they mean something very different than the way we've been talking about it. So contrast, for instance, the way uh, Dan Dennett uh, critiqued and rejected this classic account from the 80s and 90s of qualia. Um, the way that Tononi and Cook talk about qualia is radically different than the way, say, Nagel or Chalmers or some of those uh, some of those folks um, mean by it. Uh, however, uh, this view ends up being a sort of panpsychist view that resembles um, Nagel and some of the other old classic views like Plato's, where uh, in effect, an implication of the position is that everything in the universe is a little bit conscious. Now that sounds weird, but given the way they define consciousness as integrated information, there's a lot of different systems that reflect or contain um, or that capture information. And because consciousness is measurable on a scale, they have it open and available to them to say that some things, some objects have very, very little consciousness in them, but some objects, some systems, obviously like human being systems, cognitive systems, have a great deal of consciousness. Uh, okay, so towards that end, to be conscious on their account is to possess and integrate information. All right, so what does that mean? All right, so there's some notable things about consciousness that they want to emphasize that sort of brings out what they're after, what they're most focused with. So conscious states are highly differentiated and information rich. So when you're looking at this, I think this is a Monet or uh, another one of the, sort of one of the um, uh, impressionist painters. When you're looking at a field, a vision, a field of view like this, you're immediately uh, aware of um, it, it, you know, almost endless amounts of tiny details, highly differentiated, the different textures, the different colors, the different shapes, the different lines. It is highly information rich, and you uh, acquire uh, an awareness of that, a consciousness of that uh, immediately, and it's all available to you as a whole. And I should also note that I'm throwing the word awareness now, around now, and I'm not, um, I'm being sloppy, I'm not using awareness in the formal technical sense that we use it with Graziano. So Graziano gives us a technical self-referential account of awareness on top of attention. That's all different than the way these guys are talking about it. So I've backed up to kind of a different set of a different lingo. Okay, so what does integration mean? IIT is Integrated Information Theory of Consciousness. The information of conscious states is highly integrated as a whole. Okay, so 
that can sound a little empty in some ways, but let me see if I can tease out the details of what that means. Well, the details are all bound together as unified scenes. So when you look at this, you know, piece of this mural, this graffiti mural, and imagine you were standing on the street looking at this whole thing. So you're immediately aware of the whole picture at once, and you know that you're thinking about your where it's contained in consciousness. Uh, it's a unified scene. So there's not there's that that your uh, that you are connecting the little pinkish face on the bottom left-hand corner with the red face on the bottom right-hand corner and all the ones in between. They're all part of the unified same scene. Your system, for instance, doesn't split up awareness of one of those as separate um, with a, as, as your system doesn't possess awareness of one of those and then some other system is conscious of yet another. So Christoph Cook is fond of using split brain patients as examples in many of his lectures discussing this, that with split brain patients, and these are people very often who've had um, severe epilepsy, and they've severed some of the connective uh, pathways between the hemispheres of the brain, again, the corpus callosum. They've split, brain, split brain patients in some ways can look very normal, but there's strange um, behaviors that come out when we start testing them that it looks as if there are two minds inhabiting their uh, their brain or ha inhabiting their skull. So imagine that you had a different little mind that was aware of every little different face in this picture and they weren't talking to each other, they weren't communicating with each other, they weren't, um, there wasn't joint awareness of the whole thing. Very strange, uh, that would be, you know, uh, imagine I'm in a crowd, a crowded room of people and um, each one of us has a single sheet of paper that has one of these faces on it. Okay, that's a room full of 30 people with 30 different conscious awarenesses of 30 different single faces. But that's not the way you comprehend the scene. Your system doesn't grab it as pixelated, separated, uh, divided units that way. Your consciousness grabs this whole scene as a single unified scene. So that's what we mean by as a whole versus as pieces. You don't gather it up as pieces. And in fact, if there's some other mind in you that uh, is autonomous and separate from the one I'm talking to right now, uh, you'd be none the you wouldn't have you wouldn't have access to it. So suppose I'm talking to you, and again, Christoph Cook uses this example of your stomach, your enteric, enteric nervous system. Your stomach has a hundred million or so neurons that are dedicated, that, that operate in your digestion system. And he raised this possibility in a lecture of, well, um, how do we know that that system, or why is that system not uh, conscious, yet your, the system that's in your brain is? And I had this sort of insight of, well, maybe it is, maybe your stomach is conscious, but it's just not a consciousness that talks to the one that's in your head, the one that you're familiar with, the one that talks to me. Um, very sort of creepy idea, right? So if you were inhabited by, or if a room is full of multiple consciousnesses and they're independent, then they don't, they have the different contents and they're isolated and walled off from each other. Okay, you're not walled off from each other. Um, you grab that whole thing. So we're talking about that awareness, that consciousness that unifies that whole scene. You cannot just be conscious of this in black and white, for instance, you can't turn it off, or just part of the field of vision. And you cannot fail to see that your friend is crying, for example, when you look at her face. You can't see that as separate things. You can't see tears as one thing, and then a face is another, and your friend is yet another. Um, you're a single you that grasps, grasps a single vision, a single unified field in front of you. Um, you. Of course, you can attend to, with more focused attention, a single part of the field of vision. We've already done that. I can look at the, the more pink face down on the bottom left, and I can be, focus some more cognitive resources on that and attend to it. But I do so still keeping that face synthesized and connected to the rest of this whole scene. That's not an isolated or walled off consciousness. That's not synth synthesized or integrated with the rest. You integrate that whole scene. It's all part of a unified, synthesized whole. Okay, so that's one of the sort of central aspects of consciousness that Tononi and Cook want to focus on. There's some, that, that there's, that's what they want to get to with their uh, theory about what consciousness is. Consciousness is integrated 
information is an inter integrated information theory. Okay, so um, it is furthermore viewed from a single unified perspective. So these two unities go together. And this is a point from Kant that there's two unities in awareness and consciousness. There's the unified self that threads together um, me from moment to moment to moment. I remember the me that woke up and had breakfast and that's continuous in my memory and in my actions and in my narrative on the internal conscious side that's continuous with the me that's talking now. And then there's this unified uh, world out there that I've been observing, that I've been looking at, that now includes this picture on this slide. So these two unities move through time together, a unified self and a unified whole field of vision. That's a more Kantian point than either Tononi or Cook make, but it helps a little bit to understand what's going on here. Okay, so the quantity of, of consciousness then, and again, they want to give an empirical measure of it, corresponds to the amount of integrated information generated by a complex of elements. Okay, so that's painfully vague, but we're going to explain what that means. So they want to put a quantity on consciousness, and I'm going to explain what that means in a second with a, pl with a planaria worm example. And the quality of experience is specified by the set of informational relationships generated within that complex. Now, I'm not sure I understand that second point as well as I should, but I can do my best to try to explain that in a second. Okay, so let's explain the first point about the quantity of consciousness. Conscious systems are systems that produce information, says Tononia Cook. The more inputs they are capable of taking and the more varied and diverse complexes of information they output, the more conscious they are. Okay, so I won't explain the reduction of uncertainty idea, but there's this sort of information in and then binding and synthesizing and information that comes out. And it comes out in different ways. It comes out connected, um, integrated, synthesized, causally connected and so on. You do that with your system. Well, what does that mean? Well, think about the planarian. That's this little worm. The planarian central nervous system consists of two lobes forming an inverted U-shaped structure and nine branches on the outer side of each lobe that project to the surface of the head region forming sensory organs. So this is a really simple brain like we considered with the hydra in the Graziano case. Very, very primitive nervous system. A pair of eyes are located on the dorsal side of the brain. The minimum size of this brain consists of about 8,000 neurons. Okay, so it's a very simple model. In fact, I bet that this has been completely modeled in the lab. Um, human beings have something like 83 billion neurons with 5 to 50,000 dendritic connections each. Okay, so give so use that as our contrast here. We've got a worm that's got 8,000 neurons with you know a few hundreds or a few thousands of dendritic connections each, like a connectionist network versus um, you know a human system. All right, well what that amount means then is that there's not very many inputs, there's not very many opportunities or sort of peripheral. Uh, there's not much sensory periphery here that's taking stuff in on the planaria. Um, there's not very many integrations or connections or selections of uh, bits of information in its environment that it then binds, and there's not much output, right? I mean, it, it, it reacts to its environment, probably eats, it probably responds to, you know, temperature or light or dark or some very primitive uh, interactions, behaviors to its environment. Um, so it doesn't have very many inputs, it doesn't integrate very much information, it doesn't gather much, it doesn't do much with it, it's not very conscious. But on this account it would be a little bit conscious because it's an integrating information system, but just not very much uh, on the scale. Okay, so to help us understand that, let's expand and use, I like these uh, examples that Tononi and Cook give to sort of illustrate what they're getting at. Very often helps me to understand what they're getting at by looking at something that doesn't have it. Okay, so here's something even worse than a planaria. Uh, imagine, this is a thought experiment they give in one of the papers, imagine that you're facing a screen that's turning off and on. The light's coming on, it's going off. It's coming on, it's coming off. And you've been instructed, when this light comes on, here, I don't know if this will show, there's off, on, off, on off, on. Okay, so I'm in front of a light that's going off and on. And I'm integrating that information. I'm gathering that information. 
and I'm putting it together, and I'm following instruction, I'm giving an output, I'm saying off, I'm saying on, I'm saying off, I'm saying on. Okay, so that's your job, that's what you do. Suppose you've been assigned to do this little task. Now a photodiode, um, you can get those off the internet, it's a very simple little mechanism, that's probably like a dollar fifty worth of parts right there, and you just need a battery, you probably need a power source. A photodiode, a simple light sensitive device, has been placed in front of that same screen or the same light as you have, and it has a sensor that makes the same distinction. It just notes when the light's on or when the light's off, and it gives a little output. It says on, off, on, off. Very simple circuit. You could like, get on um, you know, Spark Fun or one of these websites and order a $30 kit uh, for 10 year olds, solder the thing together with half a dozen connections, and build a little photodiode system that'll do this. It'll do the same thing. It'll say the light's on, the light's off. On, off, on, off. And that's all it does. So, first problem of consciousness is the way they put this in one of their other papers. When you distinguish between the screens being on or off, you have the subjective experience of seeing light or dark. Okay, so I. Uh, I'm looking in the little uh, feedback screen of my recording, and I can see I see that that screen's a little bit dark, and now it's light, dark, and light. And I also witnessing that with my eyes directly, so I'm having a subjective experience of my table lamp going on and going off. Um, the photodiode also distinguishes between the screens being off and on, but presumably it doesn't have any subjective experience of light or dark, so it's certainly not doing all this recursive, complicated, subjective stuff. Um, now, um, Tononi and Cook are not really going to address that issue as much as I want, but they're going to use that to distinguish the differences in degrees of consciousness and degrees of in integrated information. So what's the key difference between you and the photodiode in this case? You're both doing the same thing. You're both amounting to being light sensors. And their answer on this theory, the answer is the difference is how much information is generated. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, partly, um, you aren't merely discriminating the difference between light and dark, like the photodiode. You're saying the light's on or the light's off, or am I doing it, includes a huge amount of other information. I'm also discriminating that it's not red, it's not green, it's not blue. Um, I mean, think of the potential range of information distinctions that I can make at any given moment about my environment. I mean, to note that the light's on right now uh, is to single that piece of information out. But there's also, you know, um, a thousand, a million other things that I could have said, and there's a million of other things that I'm saying it's not um, uh, by that same act. So, you know, I'm I'm radically underemployed with this little project. I'm being told I've been told to 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 signify or to say something, say the lights on, say the lights off, when it's on and off. That's all I'm doing. But I'm capable, and my information integration system is capable of vastly more, orders of magnitude more uh, discriminations, distinctions, and work about sort of distinctions in my environment, synthes synthesized. Um, if a hundred movies were to play on the screen that's in front of me in the photodiode, um, I could talk a great detail about the countless details within those. I mean, uh, maybe what they told me was, well, just tell us when it's on versus when it's off. But, you know, suppose Star Wars is playing, or suppose, you know, Titanic is playing or something. Well, um, yeah, I can indicate that the, that the TV's on. Um, that is a thing I'm capable of doing. But it's just a tiny fraction of the other sorts of information distinctions that I can make. I can tell you all about the vast details within the screen, which is within each one of the shots. I can tell you about the storyline, the narrative, the characters, the director, the history of the movie, on and on and on, right? We could talk for days about all the other things about what's going on with the movie. The photodiode can only do, it's very dumb and it can only do what it does. It just keeps indicating whether a certain threshold of light has been met. All it can do is tell you that the screen is on or the screen is off. It's none the wiser to any of these other important embedded information relationships. It can only make a single discrimination in the world and I can make millions. How many different information discriminations can a conscious human make? You know, it's not even millions, it's indefinite, the number of things the number of ideas, things that can be said. Okay, so Tononi and Cook don't seem to address the issue of, in the, from the pre previous slide, of having a subjective experience of light and dark, or their sort of recursive subjective uh, subjectivity of having qualities of me. 
um, they don't return to that, right? Here, the only use of the photodiode uh, contrast to the human is just to point out that the photodiode has one job. It can only say, light on, light off. Uh, whereas the human can say, light on, light off, and a jillion other things that all integrate that information with everything else it's experienced and everything else it's said. Okay, so another thought experiment just tees out some more of the detail here. Um, that thought experiment starts to get us to see um, how, on their account, uh, a human possesses vastly more consciousness in terms of quantity than a photodiode. A photodiode has a tiny little single bit of it. A human has, you know, a gajillion bits of information. So now let's increase or improve, expand the example about the photodiode. Imagine you've got a digital camera with a sensor input chip that has a million binary photodiodes in it, um, each with a sensor and a detector. And that's what that's what a camera amounts to, is that you, it's got a whole array of individual photodiodes that are registering all of the little pixels of light and dark in the field of view that you pointed the camera toward. Uh, okay, so combined, these detectors um, in the camera can distinguish among two to the one millionth alternative states. That is, a camera, uh, a digital camera can capture vast amount, vastly more amounts of information. Uh, but what's important here, though, still, is that the camera, and the camera would respond differently to every frame from every movie that was ever produced. So it's, it can capture more information than the single photodiode can. Um, but it's still not conscious in this more, or it's not as conscious, I should say. It's not that it's not conscious. On their account, their panpsychists, it's more conscious than the photodiode, but still not even on the playing field of what humans are, not possessing what they've got. Okay, so what's the difference between you and the camera now? The difference is integrated information. The chip cannot integrate any of its information. So the camera can capture a whole scene, that makes it a little bit more like looking at that field of graffiti like we looked at before. It can grab the whole scene and we kind of think of it as, as possessing all that information. But it's not tying any of that together. It's not binding the right hand side to the left hand side. It's not grasping color. It's not making any other conceptual distinctions. It's just a bunch of stupid photodiodes that happen to be adjacent to each other, but they have no capacity to connect or integrate their information. Its photodiodes do not have any way to interact, to connect, or to relate the info. Each photodiode performs a local discrimination, but that discrimination has no incorporation, no combination, or causal interaction with the independent discriminations of all the others. Uh, you know, so the difference is that if I've got a Google folder full of pictures of my kids, um, I know those are pictures of my kids, and I know the histories of my kids, and I know their faces, and I know the narrative and the continuity of their lives, and how they connect to me, and I know who they are, and I know what they, you know, the grades they got in sixth grade, and and on and on and on. That's a that's a that's a a, a folder of pictures of my kids. So there's a lot of re referring going on there, but uh, Google has zero. Uh, the, the Google platform has zero consciousness of that. Um, uh, folder as being of those things. There's no things there. That's all just data. That's all just bits that are recorded there. It has no further integration or connection together. Okay, so uh, furthermore, they say, they, they point out, I think this is Tononi, there's no point of view associated with the camera trick, trip, camera chip, chip as a whole. So again, go back to my example of the two Kantian unities. Um, neither one is present here for the for the camera. There's neither the unified self that threads together or connects together the different states of the self, nor is there a synthesis or binding of the different individual photodiode bits of data in each of these different pictures. Um, the camera is just a bunch of dumb photodiodes that happen to be collected in the same device. If the sensor chip were cut into a million pieces, each holding its individual photodiode, the performance of the camera would not be changed at all. It would still it'd be a weird camera, but it wouldn't be uh, any dumber on this account. Okay, so what's the difference between you and the camera? The difference is what you can do to those inputs. Your system unifies the, those inputs into a whole. From your perspective, you saw a whole movie that was part of your larger body of experience.
um, you bound and synthesized all that information. You know that the Google uh, folder is full of pictures of your kids, um, and these systems don't do any of that. They don't unify any of that into holes, either self holes or object holes. To generate consciousness, then, uh, they give a kind of preliminary list. A physical system must be able to do several things. First, it needs to discriminate among a large repertoire of states. So it, this is just out at the boundary layer at the uh, sensory periphery. You know, our planaria example is pretty simple in this regard. It doesn't discriminate among very many large repertoire of states. There's not much out there for it to gather, that it can gather with its you know, primitive nervous system but you can. Um, it must be unified, that is, it should be doing so as a single system. So if we sever the system into different parts, then you get, if anything, you get, you, you violate or break down the unity of consciousness, or you get different little dumber minds with much less consciousness themselves. So consciousness is, uh, on their account, the synthesizing into this bigger whole, one that's not decomposable into a collection of causally independent parts. So there's this sort of critical threshold for their, on their account, where you're putting it all together into this whole. Um, you discriminate among a vast repertoire of states as an integrated system, one that cannot be broken down into independent components, each with its own separate repertoire. We can't do that. I mean, we, could, we can, you know, talk about an individual neuron in your system, uh, and we can isolate those, and we think about their function, but they're, they're integrated into the function of this larger whole in a way that the photodiodes and the camera are not. Uh, phenomenologically, every experience is an integrated whole for you, one that means what it means by virtue of being one, and that should make some more sense now, and that is experienced from a single point of view. Okay, so hard to measure that. Um, notoriously, one of the most sort of ephemeral mercurial concepts in in modern philosophy and they're 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 at least recognizing this and i think i think i hadn't fully re appreciated how close this is to some of the stuff in Kant's account of the self um but the difference here is that they're trying to put a measurement on it so all this talk in the article about phi um is them trying to create a number that measures how much information is coming in and then how many binding connections can be made by a system and there, therefore, you have smarter, dumber systems, or more conscious or less less conscious systems as a function of that phi uh, uh, ratio. Um, okay, so they also make this assertion, and this one's uh, perhaps I can have, I can help you less less with it. Experience as a maximally irreducible conceptual structure. Okay, so they say the elements of a complex. Okay, so a complex, for instance, is is this. Um, network of neurons that forms your brain that's making all of these uh, bound or binding connections between bits of information. The elements of a complex form a maximally irreducible conceptual structure also known as a quail. Okay, so that's their, the singular for qualia. A quail exists in a space called qualia space whose axes are given by all possible past and future state of the complex. Okay, that's the weirdest and most abstract and most different way of describing that that we've heard all semester. Um, but what they're trying to do is say, you know, imagine the planaria and the, the limited range of uh, information that can come in. And we could, you know, imagine you plot that in a multi-dimensional graph, like a three-dimensional three space or more dimensions. And imagine 8,000 neurons um, and the various ways in which they can integrate or connect, and then and the sorts of outputs they can give out. So they're uh, trying to portray uh, being the subject of experience is being one of these cohesive whole structures, and then the state you're in is this qualitative state. So right now, when I'm you know smelling someone's dinner cooking, or when I'm um, looking at the the green leaves the tree blowing, my information system is in a particular uh, responsive state to that. It's registering that information and doing something with it and binding it and then outputting the sentence, you know, the, the green leaves on the tree are blowing.
So that's information from my environment that came in through the sensory apparatus and then got bound and then got sent out. Okay, so I was in a qualitative state there. And there's a there's an you know indefinite number of possible qualitative states I could be in when I form those different integrations. Uh, and this is a way of getting away from the spookiness, I think, of the way um, uh, you know, some of our other earlier philosophers talked talked about qualia. They talked about it as being this irreducible atomic whole, and they're trying to measure it in terms of this phi number, and put a number on it that's related to the number of uh, elements in your complex. Every concept is a point in the space which specifies the probability of past and future states of the system, given the state of the particular mechanism within it. Um, I don't know if I can explain that. I don't know if I understand it. I think part of the idea here is that, look, um, if I put you into a um, advanced neuroscience seminar in at Harvard Medical School, um, your system is probably only so capable of understanding what's going on. Um, and there's not, there's a lot that you can't you know, you're not a Harvard-trained neuroscientist, and neither am I. Uh, there's a lot that you wouldn't be able to comprehend or, or, or synthesize or say or produce out of that. We can make predictions about what sorts of past and future states of your system can happen, and same for mine. We can say a lot about the, the more likely outputs that I might produce given my experience, given my past, given my the state of my system. So there's boundaries here on where where in qual, qualia space I can move because of um, the uh, the integrations or the, the construction of my system. That's about all I can do with that. I think we've got to go to Tononi and Cook to get to a better answer for what that means. The constellation of all concepts together constitutes the shape of the quail. Now, I don't know if they, I honestly don't understand whether they think that everyone's consciousnesses can be plotted into this great big grid um, or whether a single person is one of these and we can draw some conclusions about them. There's a lot I don't understand about um, this part of their theory. Uh, but that's okay. We can push on and get some things out of it. Central, the central thesis of integrated inf information theory then is co a conscious experience is identical to a maximally irreducible conceptual structure. And I think this has to do with um, your mind not being divided into multiple minds, um, or, uh, like we talked about in the beginning, um, that there is a single unified whole that... Um, that is the sort of upper boundary of, of your consciousness. There's things within it and things not in it, and it has its as disunified um, uh, wholeness to it that gives it the unified self and the unified object. That's the irreducibility, I think. But I'd be curious to think what Tononi and Cook would say about my rendition of their position. How can we measure it? Uh, we must quantify the information generated by a system above and beyond the information generated independently by its parts. Uh, and th this makes some more sense, right? The number of, uh, I, the, the, the quantity of information I can produce in virtue of my individual neurons or subsystems doing what they do is, is you know, massive. It's a sort of um, synergistic number, right? That my neurons all working in concert can produce all of this more information than any one of the parts can produce by themselves. With the camera, the information just passes through without any higher level discriminations being made. The camera doesn't bind any objects. It's not aware of any things in there. All it's doing is just keeping track and registering um, pixels in the field of view. Uh, and it keeps them lined up, but that's all for your sake. It doesn't have any awareness of objects. Its outputs simply mirror its inputs. They just pass through uh, with very little work done in the meantime. The system generates no integrated information above and beyond what is generated by its parts. But we can imagine AI systems that do, that recognize, for instance, cats really well. You know, they've trained up these AI visual re recognition systems on millions and millions of pictures off the internet, including pictures of cats, and gotten them really, really good at recognizing cats. Okay, so that's a thing that's more conscious than a single photodiode or an array of photodiodes or a digital camera on Tononi and Cook's account. 
So an AI system is kind of conscious. And it's more conscious insofar as it's more able to make those integrations. There's no synthesis in the camera of low-level discriminations with each other. Um, okay, so in a system like yours with high integrated information capacity, the parts of the system must be connected to each other in a way that information is generated by causal interactions among its parts. Um, when you have an experience of a visual field, like looking at this Star Wars mural, how many potential discriminations can you make beyond the activation of your rods and cones by themselves? Okay, so the, the photo diode array or your retinal wall that I've got a picture of here receives light and those different cells on your retina register um, you know degrees and gradations of light and color on um, the retina okay that's a little bit like your digital camera but that's just the start of the process because the start of the process hits your eyeball there but you're able to look at that scene and you can identify a hundred different things within that scene and you can talk about the story of Star Wars you can talk about all those different spaceships you can say many more things than just the pixelated information that strikes your eyeball in that case that's what they're trying to get at with this sort of value added by the conscious system taking that um, data as inputs and then binding and combining it together at this higher level. Okay, so in conclusion, consciousness on these guys' account is integrated information. In short, integrated information captures the information generated by causal interactions in the whole over and above the information generated by the parts. That's what's going on at these higher and higher levels of integration for your neural systems. Um, and that's it. Uh, there's a lot more to be said about Phi, a lot more to be said about Tenoni and Cook, but for our purposes, uh, that's the that's the, the extent of what I want us to sort of draw out of their account and see how it contrasts with some of these other characters like Graziano, Dehane Nakaj, and the rest.